As we've been studying through the book of Romans, I have said on more than one occasion, and hopefully you can even finish this sentence for me, the gospel is not just a one-time message to be believed, but it is a lifetime message to be embraced. The Lord has saved us, and we cling to that gospel And that gospel changes us on a daily basis. Paul has laid the groundwork for the guilt of all man and all mankind. He's presented salvation by grace alone, through faith alone. And now in this portion that we are in now in the book of Romans, he's putting the legs to that or that lifetime message that is to be embraced. We're saved by grace through faith. What does that mean for me presently And here, specifically in Romans 7, 13 through 25, that gospel that's to be lived out, to be embraced, finds us here needing help in our sin struggle. And that the gospel offers us help for our ongoing sin struggle. That's what we find here in Scripture before us. Romans 7, 13 through 25. Has then what is good become death to me? (laughs) Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, (laughs) sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, I do not practice, but what I hate, that I do. If then I will, but sin that dwells in me. And then verse 18, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, my unredeemed nature, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I have trouble accomplishing. I do not find For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I keep on doing, that I I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. Uh, Verse 21, then, I find in a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, Warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Oh, wretched and miserable man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Heavenly Father, as we Read Paul's lament about his present and continued state and a place of longing to please you more than he found the ability to do. Lord, we all can relate. Lord, we long to walk with you more closely than we do. We find the sin struggle greater than we'd like to admit there's a chasm between what we know to be right and good and what we find our present words, thoughts, and deeds accomplishing. And so, Lord, in our sin struggle, as your precious blood bought people this morning, would you be our help? Would you use this passage as Balm to our souls. Lord, we pray that we would drink deeply and you would minister to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. By way of introduction, as we've read these self-effacing and humble words from the Apostle Paul, as he lamented his inability to live up to the standard that he knew to be so right. 
I must tell you that some people find it almost fantastic to think that the Apostle Paul could actually be in such a place, having been now a, an apostle and a missionary for about 30 years at this time in his life, to still be saying such things. And so they've racked their minds, although it's insane, I know, because of Paul's writing in the present tense, the present continued tense, using the first person singular, and it's certainly a testimony of himself in which he writes. Uh, if Paul were to use the same terminology in any other statement, I am praying continually for you, they wouldn't try to find some straw man that Paul might be thinking about at this time. But they would say, maybe Paul, well, Paul couldn't possibly be talking about his present sin struggle. He must be talking about Adam personified. Or maybe about the Pharisee that he once was, the unbelieving Jew. Or, oh, or maybe the carnal Christian. I suppose a Christian could be in this place struggling with such things. But there's no way Paul could be talking about the normal Christian experience. R. Kent Hughes says this. This is Paul's autobiography. <laughs> but it is also the experience of every Christian. The normal flow of the language points us to this, but something else points, it, points us to this even more so. And that's this fact. You have a sin struggle. And any Christian you've ever known intimately. I'm not talking about on paper or you like his podcast. Any Christian you've ever lived with done a lot of ministry with has a sin struggle and you know it. The reality is this is our normal Christian experience. So today I talk to those who know this struggle. Not to those who deny it or who have known it in the past. I'm not here to convince anybody that this was Paul's present struggle. I myself know it presently. I, like a physician, have come not for the well, but for the sick. And that is the purpose of this passage of Scripture, to point us to Christ, especially those that need it the most. So if you have a handle on the old nature and cannot now presently sympathize with these words from the Apostle Paul, I invite you to leave. I have nothing else to say to you today. But if by chance you find yourself saying, I want nothing more than to please my Lord, and I lament at the chasm between what he is worth and what I offer him on a daily basis, I invite you to stay and receive the balm of Gilead and receive that which the Lord has for you today. There's help for you in your sin struggle, and his name is Jesus. Verse 13 serves as a review of last week's text. And really a review of all of chapter 7 up into this point. And the point of verse 13 is the law is not the problem, sin is. <laughs> Paul says, has then what is good become death to me? Certainly not. Meaning that the law is good. And, and we've already established verse 13, the law is holy, just, and good. And though it, it brings death, the problem is not with the law. The problem is with sin. And Paul then mentions sin four times in verse 13. But sin, that it might appear sin, like eh, that's really sinful, was producing death in me through what is good. So the problem was sin, not the law, but sin did use the law. So that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful against the black or the, uh, back, the, the white backdrop of God's holy law, or our sin has become exceedingly dark and black, even more so. 
And so sin from reviewing last week's portion, sin seizing opportunity beguiled me, trapped me, sin deceived me, and sin killed me. What's the problem? Sin, (laughs) not the holy law of God. So in this passage, Paul will talk about our trouble with sin, indwelling sin, the sin struggle. Of course, the law of God heightens it. The law of God doesn't remedy it, though. What remedies it is the gospel. And so then Paul moves on from verse 13 to verse 15, where he gives now an outline for this week's text. I am carnal, sold under sin. These would be two main ideas that the Apostle Paul will now develop for us. That the law is spiritual. So in verses 14 through 17, we'll consider that we'll consider our inability to keep the law affirms the goodness of the law. The law is spiritual. And then in verses 18 through 20, where Paul says, I'm carnal, he says, and so our inability to keep the law affirms our own fallenness and human nature. Paul simply says this, I know, or we know, or this much is obvious. The law of God is really good. It just means like, hey, the old, the old bag of bones. It's this old body that's driven by sinful, selfish whims and wants. One day we'll be released from it, thank the Lord. But right now we say there's a chasm between God's holy and good law and me and my carnality. We even use that as Christianese. Hey, man, you're being pretty carnal today. (laughs) The world doesn't use that term. What do you mean carnal, fleshly? It means like you're Adamic, Adam, of Adam's nature. Just the old man talking right there. And Paul says, you know what? There's a distance between the, the holy law of God and who I am as a carnal man. And so we agree with the... So, so here Paul then addresses both of these. First, that we know that the law is spiritual. So in verse 14 through 17, Paul declares that our inability to keep the law affirms the goodness of the law. Notice what he says here, verse 14. For we know, or verse 15, I'm sorry. He says, for what I'm doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate that I do or I keep on doing. So Paul here is speaking in the first person singular. He's speaking in the present tense. And then, but even notice in verse 14, he says, for what I am doing, that's in the middle voice. As if Paul were to say, for what I myself am doing. Like this could not be any more clear that he's speaking about himself. And he says, what I am doing and what he's doing is that what he wills to do or desires to do that is godly and holy, he's not doing. And the evil that he doesn't want to do, what he hates, he's like, don't do that. Whatever you do, don't do that. He finds himself doing. And he's, and, and he's, Saying, I don't, like, what, I don't even understand this. Like, I'm totally vexed by it. The whole situation is quite vexing, isn't it? Have you ever been so confused by this whole sin struggle that we have as Christians? I know I have. And I'm like, like, when's it going to get any easier? Like, if I'm born again and I really believe all the promises of God, why am I still prone to wander? Like, when is all of this going to change? Then it's vexing and confusing. And if Jesus died and put to death my sin, and he lives on high, and he's interceding for me, and he's living within me, like, why the struggle? Like, what I'm doing, I didn't even understand. Like, this is strange, and it seems like I should be able to get past it, fully sanctified at some point. Throw it on cruise control, right? Oh, I wish. But Paul just simply says, He says, there's a chasm. And so in verse 16, this is kind of his concluding point of this opening passage. He says, if then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good. Paul is saying, the problem's not with the law. My inability to keep the law affirms the goodness of the law. Like I want a perfect score on the ACTs. And then, oh, I did not get a perfect score on the ACTs. Well, it was a stupid test. No, 
You affirm the goodness of it, though you've fallen short of it. Oh, the, the law of God is holy. I, wanted, I want to keep the entirety of the law. All the time, I've fallen sh- short of that. Well, the law of God is stupid. No, by no means. My inability to, to fulfill that high and holy command, it doesn't say anything bad about the command. It's just all fingers pointing back to me. I'm like, okay, I affirm that the law is good. And so then Paul says in verse 18, so, but now, or, but now it is no longer, verse 17, no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. And so Paul simply establishes the fact that there is a difference between the spirit and the flesh, between God's law and what he's given us as Christians and our inability. When Jesus prayed in the garden of Gethsemane, do you remember his disciples were with him and he asked them to watch and pray for one hour and they kept falling asleep. And then he said to them in Matthew 26, 41, watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And you'd have to wonder, the Lord is going to be arrested and then killed. And all he asked for me to stay up one hour and watch with him. Like I'm weak, like, am I a crazy person? What's wrong with me? That I can't honor the Lord as I ought and as I desire. And so we affirm the goodness of the law. And then Paul says in verse 18, he He goes on to this next point, and he says, really, he's going to lay the groundwork, and our inability to keep the law affirms our own fallenness and human nature. That's what we'll see. So again, our inability to keep the law affirms my own fallenness and my own depraved human nature. Where Paul then says in verse 18, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. (laughs) For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good, I I do not find. I like, I like the ESV here. It says, for, for I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. And Paul's like, this derives from my own fallenness, my own human nature. Uh, the good that, Paul says, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. Now that's also become somewhat like Christianese. Oh, it's not me, brother. It's the Lord in me, you know. Oh, there's, there's nothing good in me. We understand it theologically, right? We understand that we're fallen. The Lord saved us and redeemed us. And the good that comes from us is not really from us, but, but it's for, for him. And it's where this whole thought comes from. Like, like, if I'm good, then the goodness derives from my own goodness. And then it's done by me. So the good comes from me. And then it's done by me and by my own ability. And then all, bless your little heart. From the goodness of my heart, and then by my ability I do it, then all the praise goes back for me. But if I say no, nothing good in me, and the good that, but any good comes from him, and then anything I'm able to do is done by him, and then all the glory is, right, for him. So Paul said, I know that in me that is in my flesh, and I believe Paul absolutely knew it. I'm, I don't want to paint a picture for you of the Apostle Paul walking around as some dastardly, incredibly sinful man every day of his life. In fact, of the people that we read of in Scripture, I don't know if there's a more self-controlled, godly man. But it was here that Paul faced a present sin struggle. Why else would Paul say, I have to die daily? Like every day I wake up, the flesh wants to take control or a suant of godliness. He was one who recognized his own fallenness. I would say more than the rest of us. You ever come up to the base of a hill and say, Oh, let's hike to the peak of that. It can't be that get into it where that hill is much more than a hill. And it becomes climb was simpler at the bottom in your mind. I believe the Apostle Paul was an incredibly godly man, and I believe that he labored more abundantly than they all, but not him, God's grace within him. And so I believe that the Apostle Paul was able to say, I know I'm a deeply carnal man, and in me nothing good dwells, because he actually sought to live a godly life. 
And the more pursuant he was of holiness, the more he realized his body and his own flesh was a great hindrance to that holiness. And he became very much aware of it, that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. That even seemingly the smallest portion, there's a small, which is a small area in your life you try to get self-controlled. Let's think of one small area. Oh, yeah. Um, how about the tongue? It's a small little member, but it boasts great evils, right? James 3, 2 says, for we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, well, then he's like a perfect man. He should be able to control the entire body. You just get that one little area of your life in control, never spout out anything that you shouldn't, and you'll be able to sanctify the whole body. Well, James 3, 8 says, but no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. I ran into that wild beast this week. Is it a basketball game? <laughs> Say no more, right? I have my wife, my mother, and my sister sitting next to me. Eleven fouls are called against us, while zero were called against the other two, and we need to win this game. And I'm actually pleading with my, you know, my son's game. I'm, like, I'm pleading with my wife, my mother, and my sister, like, please don't let me say anything stupid. <laughs> like, don't let me, like, like help me over here. I'm like, I asked them. And I'm praying, Jesus, save me, you know, from this. Plus, I mean, not only my Christian witness, my pastoral witness. I mean, there's people around. Pastor Ted, what? You're like, like, and, and like, you got to call it both ways, ref. It just came out. It wasn't I who did it. It was sin dwelling in me. I'm praying continually. And then through halftime, like, Lord, just let me be a better boy. And, uh. Because the second half went our way, I was able to. And uh, <laughs> some sanctification that way. But let me say this. You see a man who has trouble controlling his tongue at a basketball game. And I'll show you a man who has his sin struggle lap up to other beaches in his life as well. And for all of those, I will not go into detail. And for two reasons. Number one, you may be appalled by it. And that might lead you to spiritual smugness. I'm not that bad after all. Or you may say, that's it. My sin struggles are far deeper. And maybe they're of the unpardonable type. And so I'm thankful that Paul was so candid and self-effacing. But I'm also thankful that he didn't go into any detail about his sin for those self-same two reasons. Because you have a sin struggle. You have a place or places in your life where you desire to do what is right and to stop doing what is wrong. You desire that the, the giving and the generosity and all of these things is more Christ-honoring and that all of the, the sinful aspects would be removed and reduced. Genesis 6, 5 says that the wickedness was great on the earth and that every man of every thought of every man's heart was only evil continually. Jeremiah 17, 6, the, 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 the heart is deceitfully wicked above all else. Romans 3, 10, none good, none does what is right. Matthew 19, 17, Jesus said, there's none good but God. And also John 2, 25 says Jesus didn't need that anybody would testify of man because he knew what was in man and it wasn't good. I know that in me that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. And, and so, listen, Paul recognized that, that he had an intention and an urge to do what was right, but not the power. How to perform 
what is good there at the end of verse 18, I do not find. I like the ESV translated. I don't have the ability to carry it out. I realize that there's a shortcoming on my part to actually carry this out. That's why Jesus said, you're going to need my help if you're going to live a godly life. You don't have the strength in and of yourself. John 14, 5, abide in me and and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Jesus would go on to say in verse 5, I am the vine, and you are the branches. He who abides in me bears much fruit, but without me, you can't do squat. Without me, you can do nothing. Why? Because nothing good dwells in your fallen, unredeemed nature. And right now we're living in a body that wants to control us and bring those back in. We also have the Spirit of God that says, I want to do what's right. And there is, in the normal, everyday Christian experience, a battle for King of the Hill. I don't know what Paul's sin was specifically, but I know that it originated in pride and self. And it was that to which he said, I die daily. I pick up my cross daily to follow the Lord. Paul also knew that obedience to the Lord and that pursuit of holiness was possible. Otherwise, he wouldn't have urged it in Philippians 2.12. As you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But Paul also knew the source of it, verse 13, for it is God who works in you to will. My spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And so in verse 19, Paul also recognized that the problem uh, was a persistent one. It was an ongoing one. As he, as he says there in, in verse 19, For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice or I keep on doing. The New Living Translation puts it bluntly here. <laughs> I want to do what is right, but I can't. I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is... I appreciate the Apostle Paul's candor and humility. I don't know if you could find a more self-effacing pastor today. But it was through Paul's... The Lord's completing work in him by which we have from the Apostle Paul... Listen, if he's not writing... Because Paul knew it wasn't him, but it was the Lord in you will be faithful to complete it into the day of Christ Jesus. Or he who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. Or I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. Paul was like, there's no good in me, but all the good is found in him. And although I can't do it and I have great trouble accomplishing this, I know one who suffered and made satisfaction in my place. His name is Jesus Christ and in it. And so it is that the Apostle Paul moves on from, from this place to point us to these two laws, and it's the final idea of this, this text that is, that is before us today. And it's this that Paul says, I, I find that there are two things at work in my life at the same time. Verse 21, he says, I find in a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. So in verse 21, Paul mentions two halves to this one problem. He says, I, I, here I am, I have in me this desire for holiness. So there in verse 21, he mentions both halves. He says, I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who desires to do good. That right here in my, my human body, it's like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Like I have competing natures. <laughs> A desire to do good, and, and, but evil is present with me. So then he mentions the good half. <laughs> and then he mentions the bad half in verses 22 and 23. He mentions both halves in 21, and then the good half in verse 22. And he says, for I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. Paul here is certainly speaking of a believer because in his heart, he had received the new covenant, which was like, Lord, I love your law and I want to fulfill it. David said and was fulfilled in Christ, your law is within my heart and I delight to do your will. 
Hey, even before we're saved, we kind of have like the angel on one shoulder and the devil on the other. <laughs> and, and all people, all humans recognize that, the tension. But that's just conscience. But when you become born again, the Holy Spirit actually takes up residency within you. You're a, you're a new creation for sure. And then the battle's even more severe. Because the, the body in which you're trapped in wants to do sinful things. Follow sinful passions. But the spirit of the Lord that's within you desires what's right. And so that's why Paul said, put off the old, put on the new. Hey, and the help we're going to find in this is found in chapter 8. <laughs> Life in the spirit. And it's coming. It's coming. Today we, we identify the problem. And so the, we have that desire, but then the bad half, Paul, Paul talks about there in verse 23, he says, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me back into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Uh, the, Paul's thought of, of, I, you know, don't present your bodies as instruments of slavery back to sin. And Paul's saying like, like sins at the door, it's always there. I, I want to just wake up one day and let my sinful nature leave me alone. <laughs> Just one day. I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. That's fueled into a passion when I read his word and pray. Spend time with God's people. And then, oh, this old carnal nature. I find in a law that evil is present and bring, wanting to bring me back in. And so then Paul says, oh, wretched man that I am. And can you kind of picture him almost writing this on this parchment? And whether he's dictating it or writing it with his own hand, but I believe at this point Paul is, is uh, and he's probably dictating it as we know from Romans 16. But I believe that as Paul is talking about, you can hear him kind of saying the same thing over. What I do, want to do, I don't do. What I do, don't want to do, I end up doing. And he's revisited it a couple of times. And now it's just like I burst into tears. It just full alligator teardrops dropping out, and and he and he like backs away from the 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 logical flow of writing, and he just exclaims, "Oh wretched man that I am! Who will deliver me from this body of death?" And his scribe was actually Tertullus, who was writing this, and he was like, "You want me to put that part in there, Paul?" <laughs> yeah, put it in there. And John Newton then do us a great favor by saying he saved a wretch like me because we think of, oh, wretched man that I am. We think of the word wretch as just some incredibly sinful, dastardly individual. But the word actually just means miserable. And Paul says, oh, there's a misery that, that is in my heart when I can't please the Lord as I so desire. And when I'm prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. And Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus, for the day that I'll awake outside of this body and in your presence, never to sin again. No longer the battle. Oh, wretched man, miserable man that I am, who will deliver me from this body, this cage of death and all its sinful whims and wants until my heart is truly free. To worship the one who died for me. To worship the one who rose to give me life. Till his face I see. And that's where Paul was at. And he says, he asks the question, who will deliver me from this body of death? Can I get a little help over here? Help from the outside. Who's going to help me? Well, what I don't need at this point is some poindexter theologian telling me that this was not Paul's present sin struggle. And so if you have it now in your life, there's no help for you, for you. No, I've heard that voice before, and it can go back to hell from which it came. Paul gives the answer for his present sin struggle, and that was the present help of Christ. For again, uses the first person, present to say, I thank God and I continually thank God. So I am saying that I do not do what I want to do presently. I do what I don't want to do presently. I'm a wretched man presently and I thank God presently 
for help through Jesus Christ, our Lord, with whom there's no condemnation, the one who intercedes for me and has set me free from the law of sin and death, who's given me a spirit, and he is the only one that I need. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He says, so then with the flesh, or with the mind, I serve the law of God, and with the flesh, the law of sin. And he's not saying that I just succumb to this, and I just give myself into this. No. Uh, he's, he's not taking like a Gnostic thought here, like in the spirit I serve God, but I just let my body do whatever it wants. He's just saying, no, I just realize there's this competing nature. And that leads us on to chapter 8, which is one of the most glorious chapters in all of Scripture that speaks about the liberation of the believer by the Spirit of God, life in the Spirit. And if God is for us, who could ever be against us? And that's what we'll study over the next month. And I can't wait. Jesus is our Savior. There's help for us in our sin struggle. So teach my song to rise to you when temptation comes my way. And when I cannot stand... I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour, I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. Lord, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on a cross for our sin, rising again from the grave to give us life. Thank you for the gift of the Spirit by which you enable us to live a God-honoring life now. And Lord, help us to turn to you in the midst of our sin struggle. For Lord, struggle we do, but you are our present Savior and helper in time of need. And so we turn our hearts back to you. Lord, we confess our sin and our sinfulness. Would you wash us and cleanse us? Would you have your way in us? All for your glory. In Jesus' name, we pray. Let's stand for a, a closing benediction and a, and a final chorus. Hebrews 13, 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.